All right, well, thank, thanks for everyone for coming out tonight. I'm Blake Wintry. I'm the Director of Education and Preservation at the Heritage Foundation. Um, I know it's hard to tell it, but this is a full house, so we thank you for uh, practicing social distancing and working with us. Um, it's, all, it's, it's new to the theater staff, and it's new to me, too. Um, but a little bit of housekeeping, I want to thank our volunteers, um, Joan, Jill, and Martha, who came out tonight to help you all get seated and check you all in. And uh, thank the theater staff for uh, letting us use their venue and, and um, signing seats and everything. Uh, so Kari, Paul, Meg, Hunter, and Richard. So thank you to them. Um, so, you know, we're, all, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so a little more housekeeping. So when the, when the program's over, we don't want people congregating out in the lobby, just, um, you know, trying to be nice about it, but just, you know, be mindful and um, follow the rules. Uh, we're also filming tonight. Um, and so we will post the video um, on our website or other platforms in a couple of days. So if you had friends that couldn't make it tonight or couldn't get a ticket, um, they can watch, watch later. Um, also, if you brought your cell phone, please mute it or turn it off. And that's what I'm gonna do right now. So mine won't ring. Um, and then also we're gonna take questions afterwards. Um, so since we're filming this, Y'all aren't mic'd and we're not passing a mic around. Um, so either I will repeat the question or Rick will repeat your question. But we will take questions um, at the end. Um, so um, this lecture series is the Warwick Lecture Series. And it is named for our county historian, Rick Warwick. And this series is something we started earlier this year. And it highlights Middle Tennessee history, architecture, preservation authors. Uh, so in February, we learned about a multi-year uh, Historic Archaeological Survey of Tennessee Rosenwald Schools from Ben Nance of the Tennessee Division of Archaeology. Did anyone come to that lecture? In Melbourne, did anyone else? Wait over here. Um, and then uh, in the September, we're going to have a presentation from Chris Kinder, um, who is the Historic Preservation Specialist for the Tennessee, Tennessee Historical Commission. And that's scheduled for September 15th. We'll see how things go with the pandemic. Uh, but he's going to be talking on mid-century architecture in Middle Tennessee, um, and he's going to focus on Williamson County as best he can and talk about why that architecture. Uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is becoming historic now, even though a lot of people don't necessarily understand it or appreciate it. Um, but it's, a lot of that stuff is, is nearing 50 years of age, and he's going to talk about why it's historically significant. Um, so tonight's Warwick lecture is by Rick Warwick. So he's the, he's the, the namesake for the, uh, the lecture series, and he's going to be talking about the photographs of uh, Lemuel Parker. Um, so many of y'all know Rick. Um, he was appointed the county historian in 2017. He's been volunte volunteering his time with the Heritage Foundation since the early 1990s. Um, he retired in 1992 after 24 years as an educator at Hillsboro School in western Williamson County. He's authored more than 15 books, including a recent one on, on Barnes in Williamson County. And he's authored numerous articles in the Williamson County Historical Journal um, which he edited from 1989 to 2019. Um, and he's, he's uh, put up countless and written countless historical markers that are throughout the county as he's chronicled the county's history. Uh, Rick maintains his office at the Heritage Foundation, um, the Lehu McGid Big House for Preservation. And if you can't find him there, uh, you'll probably find him at the county archives, especially in the morning. So um, please welcome Rick Warwick for tonight's lecture. Come out, you. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Lem Parker on this first slide, um, as I said, was a man of many talents. And in this house, after Dr. Powell, Dr. Powell bought it, he discovered this box of glass negatives. And they turned out they were about 51 slides. There were a couple of them that were broken, and some of them were damaged with uh, spots. You, you'll see some of them on this presentation. Um, today, well, just recently, uh, Gary Fisterjohn from New York bought this house, and um, he just recently, he retired from Random House. He was editor at Random House in New York, and this was kind of his getaway house coming to Williamson County. 
And uh, he did a real smart thing. He, he bought it, I think he paid about 300000 about 10 years ago. And he sold it for a million and a half back about three months ago. So you see this little log, two-room log house, and then an L in the back. Uh, it gives us a good sign of what we, how Williamson County has prospered. Uh, but uh, thanks to Lemuel Parker, we have the community of Bingham and Leapers Fork being documented in some great slides. Okay, I made a little map for you in case some of you all uh, may not know where Bingham is, but this is just a Williamson County map, and you can see Bingham. Really, if you go on up to where Carter, uh, we have one photograph that was taken on Old Charlotte Pike that I know of, and then of course Waddell Hollow, there's going to be several families that live there. That was where the Tuckers lived, and the, and the Garretts, and the Waddells. Uh, and then you're coming down to Bingham, and Bingham is, at the time, was there was the Charlie Gray store, which was at the intersection of Boyd Mill Pike, and then there was the store, the short store, which McMillan ran later, was back up the road a little piece towards Waddell Hollow, and then there was a store actually at the intersection of Waddell Hollow, and that's where the post office was originally. And then, of course, you're coming down to Hog Eye, isn't that a lovely name? Uh, or it was the West Harpeth Cumberland Presbyterian Church. It was built like in 1850-something. It broke away from the church at Leapers Fort, which we'll see in a few minutes, and uh, brought, it became a, instead of a union church, it came down and had its own uh, congregation. And we see, we'll see pictures of it. And then uh, Parker Branch, and I, I put in red there, that's about where the Parker home is. The next house going back towards uh, Old Hillsborough Road would have been the Meacham Place, and you're going to see Margaret and Florence. And then uh, the Porner Place, which is on the corner of Hillsborough Road, and uh, it is uh, it's still standing. And... Uh, then, of course, coming down the road, you're going to come into Leapers Fork, and uh, the people out there are kind of schizophrenic in their name because many of the old timers still call it Hillsboro, and the new people like the term Leapers Fork, and both of them are interchangeable because it was Hillsboro first and then became Leapers Fork in 1818. And then, of course, there's two churches there the Methodist Church and the Church of Christ, and we'll get to see those. And there's so many little blacksmith shops and, and people involved, uh, do the doctors. There, I think there's going to be one, two, three, I think there's going to be four doctors you're going to see in this presentation. And then the, next, the last picture is down on Bailey Road, or one of the last pictures. So, this is an example, I think, of the detail that you can... Uh, see in his photographs, but this is a, a picture of him with uh, his two sons. Actually, I, I met Milton the, about the last year we were at the old school. Milton was living in Florida, and he came to the area to have a reunion, I think, with some of the family, and he came up to Hillsboro because he went to school there. And uh, so I did get to, t to speak with him. And then, of course, the next picture is uh, Milton and, and Harley and their mother. And uh, uh, Harley, he was kind of the renegade of the family. He, everybody, he was the most spoiled man in the neighborhood. His mother saw no faults in him at all. And uh, he went, had more motorbike right, uh, wrecks than, than is allowed for one human. Uh, we think that um, the earliest photograph in this collection is taken in 1911. Uh, when that, in that box of uh, negatives, they're in a, an envelope, a brown envelope, and he has very carefully identified the, what you're seeing. Some of them, those, those envelopes were gone, and so I had to do some research, and there's some of them I haven't been able to identify, but... Uh, 
so forth. Isn't this lovely? Uh, the smokehouse is still there. The logs, and this of course is his family on a burrow, and then uh, Harley's on there by, by himself. Uh, a great rural scene. I, I, the date is not on the negative, but I've tried to, knowing when Harley was born, figure out about what his age is. So I'm, I'm thinking that's about 1918. Uh, here's his mother. She was Amanda Bingham Parker. His father, her father was in the Civil War. And then she married DeWitt Clinton, uh, DeWitt Clinton Parker, and he was in the Civil War and lost a leg. And when they had the sale uh, after Miss, uh, Miss Powell was moving to town, she, she had a sale and there were still a lot of things in the house that had belonged to the Parkers and one of them was a wooden leg that came for sale and everybody joked about it. But, uh, he, he served in the county, uh, as county court clerk for several years. Uh, the populace in Franklin and Williams County were very generous to the old Confederate soldiers, particularly those that had, had, uh, were blind or had lost a limb, and they elected them to office to give them a, a good job. Down at the bottom, we have her parents, Betty Forehand of McPherson, and then John B. And see, he lost a leg, but he lost a leg in an accident at the sawmill, not in the Civil War. And then, of course, uh, would be his sister-in-law's and wife. Laura is the one sitting with uh, the dog. Isn't this a great scene? Uh, this is Fernvale, and if you all haven't been to Fernvale, you need to go. It's it's, if you're at Leapers Fork, take old 96 through Kingfield and down the hill, and you get into the South Harpeth watershed, and at the old 96 and old Harding Road is the community of Fernville. And you can see here, this is July 4th, 1915, and I have been able to identify his brother John and his wife Sadie are on, on the left there, and then Green McPherson and his wife, and... Uh, on over to uh, Harley. Laura is holding uh, Harley, and uh, then their sister-in-laws are in there, and the mother is dressed in black, and the rest of them are unidentified. And then the man standing there is John Henry Gibbons, and he lived in Fernvale, and uh, that's a, a good photograph of him. This is... Uh, Lemuel's first cousin was Robert Porner, and his father was Dr. A.B. Porner. And if you, you know me, I've been working with the Porner family because of Dick Porner. And uh, Dick Porner would have probably stayed in that house at, uh, for a while because after his father died or owner died, uh, Dr. Porner was the one assigned to own Dick Porner. Uh, and you can see his family there. There's a niece in there, Bernice Cato, and then his aunt, who is Millie Bingham Porner, and she's a sister to Amanda. And this house is still standing. It's on Old Hillsboro Road, right before you get to Parker Branch Road, if you're going towards Leapers Fork. Uh, you know, Horse and buggies were very popular, particularly with young boys like and young men like uh, automobiles are today. But this is Church Uton. I didn't know him, but I knew his two daughters, May and, and Elizabeth. Uh, li Elizabeth lived out on Carter's Creek Pike. May lived up on uh, Claiborne Street. And then Walter Tucker and the Ray girls. Now he didn't, I've got to, I just found this out today. I was going through those envelopes and very faintly I could read uh, that Walter Tucker was with the Ray girls. So I'm going to have to go figure out who they were. Isn't this lovely? I don't know who the couple there is on the left, but um, his brother-in-laws are Robert and uh, Green McPherson and Miller, of course, and his wife are in the automobile. Then this is another automobile. It's not the same, same one. And this is Dr. Harley. And that's where Harley got his name was through Dr. Edelman. And he lived right in Leapers Fork, where, if any of y'all remember where Rooster Miller lived, that was Dr. Edelman's lived there for in the, around 1916. And uh, you can see the license plate on there is a 1916 license plate. 
This is Haggai. Supposedly all the old timers told me, Miss Nan was the best authority on it. She said uh, one night they were having a service and uh, the floors apparently uh, were old and, and a knot had fallen out. And, in, and you can see it's up off the ground and apparently hogs were uh, uh, up under the floor. And one, some person looked down in the knot hole and there was a hog looking up at him. So it became hog eye. And, uh, it was there in 1971, and I'll never forget going, coming back from school one afternoon uh, on Old Hillsborough Road and seeing the ashes. Uh, it had been rented, uh, the, a family was living there, and I think they set it on fire to get a little charity because they moved to Fairview and they were crying that you know they'd lost everything. Well, it's funny, but there wasn't a refrigerator or a stove in the ashes, so I suspect they moved the refrigerator and the stove and then set the place on fire. But isn't that a lovely panorama? This is a picnic, and that's what he's got on there. Picnic uh, hog guy that's on there. And that's, uh, that's a nice panoramic scene. And then, of course, interestingly, this singing school is taken inside. If you know anything about photography, that it was difficult to take an inside photograph, and that seems to be a, a pretty sharp photograph. The man in the back with the bonnet on is Henry Mack Cotton. Of course, he had the funeral home here in, uh, in uh, Franklin. And his family, I see some of his sisters in there, Miss Ooten and, and uh, the, one of the Blankenship boys is standing there on the, at the front. But that's a very sharp picture, I think, for... <clears throat> This is probably the, the most timely picture that I have. And when I first got it, I looked and I said, VW, Volkswagen wasn't invented then. And um, I know this exactly where this is at his sawmill, which is on up the road past his house on the other side of the road, right near the creek. And this is, <clears throat> I was reading in 1918, all, all October the 5th, Franklin had a Liberty Bond parade, and the ladies organizing it had invited all the, the groups and clubs in, in Williamson County to come and march. And, and it listed all those uh, organizations that were in there, and one of them was Votes for Women. This is 1918, and of course it's right before World War II. I mean, World War I has the armistice in November 11th, and then, of course, two years later, uh, <clears throat> Tennessee brings in the perfect 36 and women get the right to vote, which we're celebrating this year. And this is another iconic uh, photograph. I love it. And you can see his mother and his wife, who I, she looks like she could be expecting, uh, or looks like they're cleaning chitlins. And then John is the man over on the, on the end there. And you notice the man in the back carrying the rifle? That is the William Kirby rifle. And that was uh, John, uh, Liam Parker's grandfather. And he was also Mr. Harold Meacham's grandfather. And Mr. Harold told me how irritated he was because he read in the newspaper that on Saturday... They were going to have a sale at Lim Parker's house, and in there was the rifle. He said, you know, I couldn't sleep that night thinking I was going to finally get my granddaddy's rifle back. He got there Saturday morning, and to his disappointment, Mr. Charlie Hefner had talked Mr. Lim Parker out of it the day before. So it never went through the sale, and Mr. Beecham never got the rifle. Today, however... Uh, it is in the, the county archives. So if you want to go see a local uh, crafted rifle, go to the county archives. And I was asking Mr. Charlie Hafner when I went down to his house to photograph it. <clears throat> it's interesting because the hammer, instead of going this way, goes out from the side. And I said, Mr. Charlie, I said, how common is this? He said, well, if I find another, that'll make two. He was a witty person. And then, of course, uh, 
the two twins there, you'll see they've got caps on, one in the back and the bottom. That is Jerry Carroll and Burl Carroll, and they were twins. And then, of course, you see the guy sitting down holding a hog head. That is John Dorton. And John Dorton was kind of taken in by the, the uh, Parkers, as, and he lived with them. I noticed in the census he's, he's listed. That's how I identified who he was. Uh, but isn't that a mess of hogs? Imagine the sausage and the hams and the tenderloins you get out of that. But isn't that a great picture? <clears throat> this is Bingham School. And I was looking at this yesterday, and I said, you know, I n knew... 10 people in this photograph and this was taken in 1911 but uh, some of you all may remember Miss Sue Owen she taught at Lipscomb Elementary too and this is her her brother Frank is uh, this boy right there and that's Miss Sue Miss Ida Mays in there that's another sister and of course uh, the Vaughn girls that's Bertha is up at the top row no and the second from the top and of course then the Meacham girls which you're going to see later are two of the finest that's Marguerite and that is Florence two of the brightest girls they graduated from uh, BGA when girls could go to BGA and uh, they were just invaluable to me knowing the community and Franklin because they both worked in town Margaretta worked with the Harpeth Insurance Company and Florence worked at the ASCS office because they knew everybody's business and they knew all the secrets. I see Hazel Blankenship right there and that's her brother. Uh, Miss, uh, she, she at that time was a cotton but she married Church Uton. Uh, is the teacher, and that was her first and only year teaching. Back then, teachers were making uh, $30 uh, a month. Her, her parents were running the poor farm uh, up in Stillhouse Hollow, so she didn't have to pay board. She could live in the community. And I think that's the only, I think she married the next year, married about 1912. This is a classic. When I got this picture from Margaret in Florence, of course, it was printed out and it didn't have a, a, the photographer's name on it. But then when I got the glass negative, it got me to thinking, oh, some of the pictures I've used in the Leaper's Fork book were taken by Lemuel Parker. Uh, you see these girls are barefooted with their little summer dresses on and uh, their white-faced bull. Boyd's Mill. This was the nerve center of the community. And not only just for Bingham, but for all over. I, I was reading some, went back and re read the Who's Who books uh, that Miss Jane Owen article she wrote, and even people living way back up Pinewood Road talked about bringing a turn of corn to Boyd Mill and spending the day while the mill was being, uh, the, <clears throat> the, the corn was being ground into cornmeal. Uh, <clears throat> the boards were famous for their mules, and you're going to see in the next picture, they had several mule barns, and some of them are still standing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> about the time, I think 1918, the, the mill was gutted of its iron. They were selling it because scrap iron was so valuable. Uh, Mr. Charlie Gray uh, bought from the shorts. And then this was used really as a tobacco barn for curing tobacco. On the side, which was added later by the shorts, was a storage as a warehouse. And Dudley Casey even rented this building to store uh, tobacco in from, for his warehouse. You'll see it was... <clears throat> the, the West Harper is a mighty river when it rains, but when there's when it doesn't rain, you can jump across it in places. And so uh, they, there was a dam there that was a, it was a really boards, cedar boards that uh, <clears throat> backed the water up and directed it into 
a, a wheel that turned uh, and operated the mill. Now, when the water was low, they had to go to steam. And so you can see uh, the, the standpipe there for the steam engine, but they also cut, uh, they, they cut lumber there. It was a sawmill. And uh, of course you see those fine uh, jacks and mules there. Of course hogs are right there um, getting their field of probably the leftovers. <clears throat> And this is a great panoramic view of, of, of my neighborhood. Uh, I, as you can see uh, Blazer Road right there where the, in the middle of the picture where the rail fence goes up. But in the background you'll see uh, this was the old Boyd place today. I see GDRs here and that's, they call that home. And then in the center you can see the big two-story building there that is the mill. Uh, right there you can see the, the pipe this is the miller house this is where uh, the miller lived and operated the mill and then these other buildings are mule barns <clears throat> i don't know if the west harpeth flood flooded back then the way it does today because i told you in 1948 they raised um, old hillsborough road to allow for those bridges and that backed the water up. And so in 1948, where there was one of the biggest floods we ever had, uh, got into the Miller House. And that was supposedly the first time until this great flood we had a few years ago. But isn't that a wonderful... This picture was taken from across the road at the old William Boyd place. And it overlooks it. There's a big barn that was there. It's, it's no longer standing, but... Uh, it, it really tells you what a fine um, <clears throat> farm that was all along the West Harpeth. Some of the best farmland in, in, the, in our county is on these streams like the West Harpeth and the Little Harpeth and the Big Harpeth and, and, the, West Har and the South Harpeth. But um, this scene is just beautiful. And of course, <clears throat> the mill, this gives us a back view and you can see the water uh, is being directed to and now the the rock foundation is still there that that was the channel for the water and uh, You can see what a big operation that was This was taken near the snow So that's why there's not a great deal of contrast in the picture and then of course at the same time He took this picture of the covered bridge now Boyd Mill Pike was really known as the South Harpeth Turnpike my favorite man in the 19th century in Williamson County was John B. McEwen. He lived over here on Fair Street. And in, in 1878, he bought uh, Smith Springs at Fernvale. And he named it Fernvale. He built the hotel. And he needed a way to get good travel from Franklin to Fernvale. And so he got all the property owners that owned land along uh, really the western part of the city of Franklin and all the way out to Old Hillsborough Road, and they created uh, the, what became known as Boyd Mill Pike. <clears throat> W.A. Boyd was the one that built the road, and he also built this bridge in 1878. And the bridge stood until 1929, and they replaced it with an iron bridge, which fell in... Uh, in the early 90s, I guess, <clears throat> the, the county road people had a, uh, they shouldn't have been on the bridge, but they were loaded with rock and they went across the bridge and a lady who wasn't from around here followed the truck and they were both on the bridge at the same time and with that, the bridge just collapsed. I should have put a picture of that in there even though he didn't do it. But uh, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is a good scene. Yes, I'm, I'm okay. okay. Yeah, I'm okay, thank you. All right, now this is uh, up Waddell Hollow, about one of the second half, the Perry place is first, and then the Blankenship place was next. Now, May Blankenship was also a first cousin of Liam Parker, and, and I'm pretty sure there's no name on this photograph, but <clears throat> I should have asked Hazel when she gave me the picture, uh, 
Hazel is the little girl. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, hold it. Wrong. I'm sorry. I, I'm looking. The screen's messing me up. This this is the short farm. I mean the uh, Charles Boyd place. He was a Civil War soldier. In his house, if you're in Bingham going towards West Haven, this would be the last house or next to the last house before you get to the property that is now West Haven, which would have been the old gray place. <clears throat> But this is the family of the Shorts. Serena Brown, I think, uh, uh, was the, the last maybe to live there before it, it burned. Now, this is the Blankenship. Excuse me. Uh, Joe Blankenship was the town or the village blacksmith, and his blacksmith shop was there next to the Short store. Uh, it... Uh, and he operated it until he died, and I'm not sure exactly. It was in the 50s, I'm sure, uh, when he when he died. But <clears throat> you can see the family. Sadly, that house is gone. But I think the the log uh, corn crib, not corn crib, the log smokehouse is, is still standing. And this is further up Waddell Hollow, and uh, you'll see there uh, Nellie Waddell Garrett. The Garretts and the Waddells intermarried along with the Tuckers. And um, the, uh, they're all in-laws there standing in front of a log house, which stood until it, it burned sometime in the 20s, <coughs> Miss Sue Waddell's house. And, of course, uh, that's uh, Luther Waddell and Leland. Leland was known as Punkin Waddell, and uh, <coughs> he continued. His father had a, black, had a sawmill with the steam engine and the steam engine, I went up there the other day and the steam engine has been moved, but it's set right beside the road until just a few months ago. But uh, uh, a nice, nice family. I knew, Le I didn't know Leland, he died before I came to the community, but uh, Luther lived in Nashville and worked for the l &N in the yard. Isn't this a great couple, Sophronia and uh, Solomon King? Is that not the longest face you've ever seen? Uh, he, uh, they lived in probably the, one of the poorest hollers in Williamson County. When you get to Kingsville and, and go down the hill, going towards Fernvale, they lived down there at the head of Basin Springs. And there's nothing down there but rattlesnakes and copperheads, but they raised a family. And um, John B. McKinnon, no, uh, Horace German tells this story in his articles, The Night Watch, about <clears throat> Saul King brings in a load of hog, drives uh, some hogs from his farm into uh, uh, town and, and sells them to Mr. McEwen. Well, Mr. McEwen, there had been a fire down at the railroad station and, and the Parham uh, granary burned and it scorched all the grain. And so uh, Mr. McEwen had a dairy out here on National Pike before you get to Mac Hatcher, and he was taking the old milk and mixing it with the burnt corn, and it fermented. And so all these hogs got to eating that slop, and they got drunk. And when those King uh, Ridge, Ridgeback hogs got in there with Mr. McEwen's, there was the awfulest hog fights you've ever seen. So you just can't even trust hogs when they get drunk. And of course, this is the picture of the farm, the mill hands at Southall Brothers. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to identify them, but I'm pretty sure they're Kings House, Inman's, Hargroves, and Furloughs. Uh, and they all, all those guys worked at the sawmill, and you're going to see a picture of it in just a minute, but. Uh, probably maybe that whole bunch never learned to read and write. They were unschooled, but hard workers. Now this is one of the best pictures. I'm glad Laverne's here. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, some of her family. It's Mr. Kerry Reynolds is the heavyset man down at the bottom. But uh, they had the steam engine that was mobile that went from farm to farm during thrashing season. And you can see uh, uh, the Jim and 
Kirk uh, Reynolds there um, trying to, what, ha what has happened, they've gone across the bridge there at, at Miss Nan's house, which you see Miss Nan Chapman there is in the background. Michael, that's one of those L houses you're talking about. It was built in 1903. Uh, and what they're doing, they're, they're having to jack it up to get it out of the, uh, out of the way. That opening was necessary because at the Charlie Gray place, he had, he had land on both sides of the road, of Old Hillsborough Road, and he needed a way to get his cows down to the next field, and you, you didn't want to cross the turnpike. And so this allowed the, the water to go through, and it also allowed uh, the cattle to go from one field to the next. And I think some of those rock walls are still there today. They've just built over them. I'm glad the Lemkes are here tonight because this is their house, but at the time, this was the Charlie Gray place. Uh, <clears throat> it was placed on the National Register in 1988. And uh, I'm sorry that the, uh, there's a misfigurement there in the, on one side of it, but uh, this house looked pretty much like that when I came to, to uh, town. The Rydens did something to it and then the, uh, the Lemkes have even improved it more, but uh, <clears throat> that was kind of the nice house in the, in the building, in, in the community. Here's now one of those L houses, Michael. This was uh, where John Parker, Lem's brother, he built a house right at the intersection of Parker Branch Road and uh, <clears throat> Old Hillsborough Road. Later behind it, Calvin Leahy's father had his sawmill there. And this house became Mr. Uh, Floyd Vest's house. And they died, and their grandson, uh, Chris, inherited it, and he let it, didn't keep a roof on it, and it literally fell in. And I noticed in the last year it has been torn down. But it was a fine house. Uh, so, there aren't these some characters. <clears throat> uh, the couple that's holding the child is uh, Les Logan and uh, Janie Ray, and the little boy is German Logan, and German used to live right in the crossroads of uh, Forest Home and O'Hillsborough Road, and uh, he and Viola were just wonderful people. But that's him. Uh, and then down below there is Lim's sister-in-law who married uh, a Ferguson and their family. And the other guy over there was Albert and his wife Matilda. And I just found them because they were, it, the age looked right and, uh, and they, it said that he worked at the uh, sawmill in 1910. So it, that was probably taken after 1910. <clears throat> Here's some more people, um, Joe Mays and his family, and Delray Reed. Now, Delray Reed was an orphan, and there was a little log house that hadn't been gone too many years between the Meacham house and the Parker house, and that's where uh, somebody that lived there took in this boy, and they called him Del Ray Reed. He went to Bingham School for a little while. I, and I don't know what became of him, but this so happened, there's a picture of him. Uh, the next at the bottom is Harley with his uh, cousins. I don't know, I can't identify those. Here's another Madonna and child photograph. Uh, the, they're not, in the background is not uh, <clears throat> the log smokehouse, but you'll notice there the swing set this was kind of common. There was a lot of them in Leaper's Fork. I don't know who was making them, maybe Lynn Parker, but it's where it, uh, the two, the swing faces each other and the platform moves back and forth. Uh, the stone wall is still there. There's an iron fence. Yeah, you can still see the iron fence behind it there. And it's still, it was there. I moved, went up there the other day to check it out. <clears throat> uh, here we have uh, Millard and Harley and then two years later, I'm going to say they're on the other side. You see how Harley's dressed up? It's a little almost a... Uh, you can tell he's pampered. Uh, and then there he is with his mother, 
and uh, his uncle in the back there is John, and then of course this John Dorton, who is no kin, but they, they have taken him in. Unfortunately, I cannot identify that family. I've looked through the census and there's, it doesn't seem to add up with three girls. And, but there is John Tucker's daughter, which that would have been up Waddell Halla, and then Dr. Edelman's daughter, which would have been in, um, in Leapers Fork. And this is a great photograph. This, of course, unfortunately, has got some damage on it, but that's Amanda Bingham, Parker, little Harley, would that be her grandson, and then this Eleanor Jane Boyd McPherson is Laura's uh, grandmother. And then, of course, there's Millard holding the dog. Apparently the Parkers were big dog fans. Can't figure out exactly what's going on there, but it may be a wedding or some kind of, but the girls there are holding a bouquet of, of uh, looks like probably native flowers. And uh, Hugh Smith is in there, that's written on there. And then uh, Alina Grimes Smith, she's a sister-in-law, I mean, she's a sister to the uh, Jenny over there. And then Mr. Green McPherson, uh, he, he worked at uh, John, uh, King Place, he, he was one of the first recappers for tires. I've got a picture of him. I think I used it in the book on uh, the square. But he, he was one of the first to vulcanize uh, and retread tires. Ah, how many little towns and villages have a photograph like this? This is the old Leapers Fork Bank. It was started in 1911, and it's lasted until 1922. And a lot of old people used to tell me, oh, Daddy lost a lot of money in the bank. Well, if the truth be known, the bank only had like $10,000 operating expenses, and they weren't making enough money to even pay the clerk. So one Saturday, all the trustees of the, of the bank met and they said, you know, why don't we just give everybody their money back and close this building down? And that's exactly what they did. There wasn't, there wasn't just much money out there. There's a few people, the Meachams had some money and the Hunters had some money. Uh, and they, they gave the money back and closed it down and sold the building. In the background, you'll see uh, that two-story house and then there's another house in between there. Unfortunately, uh, there was a fire in that two-story building in 1931. Uh, Mrs. Zach Green was making preserves. Across the street, the Church of Christ was having their uh, midsummer revival, and somebody just happened to look out and see that the roof was burning across the street, and so everybody went out of church and they knew the Sweeney house was right next door and it was going to catch on fire. There was no doubt about it. It was a hot, hot day, dry day. So they went in and took the doors, the mantles, anything, on it, all the furniture, took it and put it out in the street so it wouldn't burn. But the heat was so hot that the, the, the shape roof at the church kept catching on fire. We'll see a picture of it in a minute. And so the people had the men had to climb up there and pour water on it to keep it from burning. This is a very nostalgic view of the village. You're looking east, I guess, standing not in front of the church but close to it, and you see the bank. And there was a store there. Mr. Gus Carl ran the store, and uh, it just looked like something out of a movie. The scene to me. And then, of course, this is John Parham and his wife, Virginia, and Laura, which married Alec Jones. And then there's Bunyan Parham. And he later, that was his house. He, he raised his family there. And he married one of the Blankenship girls, Bonnie Blankenship. And then you see the, the old store. Now, pretty much today, this hasn't changed a great deal if you go to Leapers Fork. And the post office was there from 1818 to 1918, except for there was occasion during, of course, that great unpleasant in the mid-1860s, uh, the post office was discontinued. 
But you can see the bar there that you would hitch your horses to. And I used that picture. Mr. Uh, Bunyan loaned me that picture to, to, to copy, and I didn't, re I didn't think to ask him who took it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Liam Parker. And then, of course, you're looking the, in the same direction, but just further back, and you can see at that time, people came to church in their buggies and, and horses, and they hitched them up and went to church, and it didn't interfere with the turnpike. Now, you'll notice on uh, the other side of the street, one of the great citizens of that little village, the Burg, as some of them call it, uh, was L, uh, J, Joseph L. Sweeney. He, on his own accord, built the sidewalk. Today they bricked it, but it, before he had uh, yellow rock lining it, and then it was they went to the creek and, and got uh, the sand and the gravel and filled it up. And so that little town had, had a sidewalk before some places in Franklin did. Looking further down into the village in the back there, you can see, of course, the, uh, the bank. And across the street, the two-story building there you see, you're going to see again, but that is Dr. Tucker's uh, doctor's office. And then the big building behind it, of course, was built in 1914, and that was uh, the uh, Odd Fellows Hall on the top floor, and Mr. Frank Gray had his drugstore and grocery store on the first floor. And <clears throat> when I was researching this, I one day was in the uh, nursing home visiting uh, Mr. Jerome Lund, who's one of the brightest men and the kindest man. man. And I said one day, I said, do you know anything about uh, the old store? He called it the South Hall store because the South Halls owned it later. And he said, I guess I do. I dug the foundation. He said, I quit school in 1914 to go down there and, and build that foundation. And that's so you can't get a better story than that. And sure enough, I found in the paper where they were opening the Frank uh, Gray drug store and store, and it was 1914. And then I found a, I have in, in my the book on Leaper's Fork, there is a, a flyer that has the uh, Odd Fellows Lodge and it lists all the members. And so he, he was right. Here again is the man, Joseph L. Sweeney. Uh, the Sweeney's were kindly a family. When I went to Hillsboro in 1971, uh, one of the best things that ever happened to me, Miss Milbury Mahan took me down to introduce me to the Sweeney's. And they were a group of three sisters and a brother. And they adopted me. And I, I felt at home there anytime I wanted to go in and, and visit with them. But their grandfather was Joseph L. Sweeney, and so I've, I've gotten personal stories from them about their grandfather. And he must have been a real whiz. Uh, in 1913, as you can see there, his wagon, if you can read that, it's patented in September 30th, 1913, and it was a U.S. patent, and I, they had the patent and uh, I think they gave it to me and it's in one of my files. But anyways, uh, he uh, had one of his sons go around with the little model, and I had that at one time, but I gave it to the grandson because he, 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 he deserved it. It was his family, not mine. But uh, what was so great about it, you'll see in another picture, the sides, if you wanted to haul hay, you could let it out and it would have bulk, or if you want, you're hauling wood or corn, you could put it upright, the sides upright, and haul that. And he, he invented that. Now, on the, his house unfortunately burned in 1931, and because they, all the doors, everything, went, everything in the house just about was dismantled, and they did it so quick because there were so many there, all the furniture was saved, then <clears throat> When they built it back, they built it pretty much today. It's standing, and you look at it, and you see, yes, that's, that's almost the same house. And I don't think it maybe has enough filigree and, uh, that you would expect. But uh, 
the Church of Christ is right across the street, and this family was what you call die in the wool Church of Christ. Beautiful voice. They sang a cappella on the porch, and you feel like you were in another time. Here, here's the working part of it. This set right in the village across from the bank and next to the Church of Christ. You can see in the lower picture there, the Church of Christ is in the background. And again, you, he's got the sides down on the bed so you could see how it was used for, um, for hauling hay. And then, of course, you see the men there. They also made wagons. Uh, he did blacksmithing, but he was an industrialist. He, he, he really had an eye for uh, making things work. Uh, and this is, I think, a great picture of, the, of that town. And it was a great place. That's probably the nerve center of town. Everybody would stop by there and catch the gossip and the news of the day. J.T. Sweeney was uh, a son, and he had his blacksmith shop. About, if you know where Puckett's is in Leapers Fork, they tore down the blacksmith shop in 1952 or three to build Puckett's. And then the house that you see that J.T. Sweeney was in, Mr. Leahy had bought that in the 30s, and he moved the house back as far as he could. The stage is there today and uh, he built a filling station for uh, Mr. Pewitt, who was his son-in-law. But that's, that's an interesting house, and unfortunately, uh, the house was torn down probably about 1991. Um, it had been rented, and it was in disrepair. Here's another doctor. This is Dr. Drake, and uh, he and his family are sitting out on the on the porch there. Uh, this is one I don't understand why he didn't, he, he and other, his other photographs were so well proportioned. To me, he, he should have backed up a little bit and got the house, but apparently he, is, he was more interested in Dr. Drake. <clears throat> and this is Dr. Tucker. N. M. Tucker and he came to Leapers Fork in 1906. Now the old Hillsborough High School Academy closed in 1905, and the county bought it and made it the Hillsborough School, one through 12. Dr. Tucker, there was a music room there, and he bought the music room and rolled it down to across the road from his house and made his doctor's office there. You can see he and his uh, his daughter there are sitting on the porch. Now, probably in the 1940s, it stayed. Dr. Coles had an office there. I think the health department even used it for a little while as a, a clinic for kids getting vaccinations and stuff like that. Well, the, the John Burdett bought it, and he turned it and made it parallel to the road and made his house, put a porch on it facing the road, and then in 1993, no, maybe 94, Aubrey Preston bought it and, and stripped it down. And, and, and when they took off some of the paneling, the chalkboard was still there with the musical notes on it. That was a great find. Here's the two houses of worship that's in the old village. And of course, you'll see the Lupus Fork Church of Christ, which was the first Church of Christ in Williamson County. It was organized in 1831. And it was it, uh, for economical reasons, I guess. Uh, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Cumberland Presbyterian, and the Church of Christ took turns of using the building. One Sunday, one would have it and another. In time, the different churches built their own individual churches. And so they ended up the, the Church Christ, or the Christian church was the one man standing. And so this building you see there was built in about 1876. They tore down the old church and built this one. And you see the steeple today is not as tall. And that's because in 1931, the, 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 the fire across the road did get onto the uh, tower, bell tower, and so they lowered the steeple to what it is today. 
The Hillsboro Methodist Church is, uh, was built in 1911. And uh, the little country churches, you know, in, in Williamson County and I guess throughout Middle Tennessee and around are having trouble because uh, pe new people are moving in and, and they don't want to go to a little church. They want to, they, they've got children, they want a Sunday school program, they want a gym to play in. And, but uh, the church at Leapers Fork Methodist Church is really holding on, uh, and it's a, it's a nice little church, building-wise, nice brick church. And <clears throat> the real economic engine for Leapers Fork, of course, started in 1909 when the Middle Tennessee Railroad came from Franklin through Leapers Fork on down to Boston, on over down to Water Valley, and on into Mount Pleasant. And it made two trips a day. It started out being a big steam engine, and they found out, you know, there just wasn't enough um, movement out there. So they went to a little dinghy, they called it, and it, and it was operated by a gasoline engine. And, but it used the tracks. But for that area, most everything west of Hillsboro, particularly on the Backbone Ridge and on out towards Pinewood Road, had great timber. And a lot of it had never been cut because there wasn't any way of getting it to town to sell it. So the, the South Halls uh, built uh, their mill right there next to the depot. And of course the railroad was there and they were cutting the best walnut and maple for flooring. Uh, one of the things on this lower picture you'll see on the other side of the railroad track, which is right next to the creek, a company came in here and started buying up all of the uh, dogwood and hornbeam trees. If you know anything about there, the hard wood. So that's really why you don't see any big dogwoods, a slow grower. And it takes, you know, years for it to get any size. And they were making shuttles there. And so Mr. Sweeney told me as a boy, he'd go and watch them make shuttles. And of course, they'd load them up and uh, ship them to wherever the textile companies were. They were all over Tennessee and North Carolina. But uh, hornbeam and uh, dogwood trees almost disappeared from the least backbone ridge. This is a great scene. In Franklin, uh, all during the teens and the 20s, uh, the businessmen in town wanted the country folks to come to town to trade. And so they had what was called Franklin's Boosters. And uh, this is one of the first ones. And they came by train. And you can see the men up there are dressed in blackface. And you see it says, we want your trade. And they really came to entertain the local folks and trying and giving out little uh, uh, gifts to get them to come to town. And it worked. I, I've studied this picture many, many times, and I, Mr., the guy standing there with the cigar in his mouth up towards the front is Mr. Owen, Mr. Frank uh, and Ida May and Sue's daddy. The rest of them I can't make out. But you see, the depot is very similar to the one that's still standing at McKnight Station, which is further down into Murray County. Uh, but a great picture. Unfortunately, <laughs> you see it's kind of crackled there. I made the mistake. I was showing it to uh, uh, the kids at school one day, and I was using an opaque projector. And I got busy talking, and I forgot to take it out from under the heat. And so it's... Uh, it's not there. If Steve George is here, he may have the original to this because Mr. this came from Mr. Gooch, Joe Gooch. Mr. Joe Gooch, unfortunately his house is not in here, but he lived right as you go into the village. And his only job was the railroad. He started in 1909 as a young man uh, and he, he worked the railroad, rode twice a day. And he said he was going down into uh, getting down around McKnight Station, he said every other day or so, there was a, a farmer standing there with a, with a, uh, 
a milk can. And they'd load it on the train and send it to Franklin. And he said, they kept doing that, doing that. And he said, you know, he doesn't have any cows. <laughs> so one day he opened it up and it was moonshine. <laughs> he was shipping his moonshine on the doodle bug into Franklin. Those guys in Murray County are clever. Uh, this house, unfortunately, is no longer standing, but there's one on the same foundation that is there. This is called Benton Heights. It was built about 1910 by W.L. Pinkerton, who was the guy that convinced the locals to start the bank. He was from down in uh, Centerville, and he came up here and said, there's enough capital in this little community, and the people need a bank. And so he started the bank, and he built this house. Uh, near this place is where the Benton sister, Thomas Hart Benton's family came here and the, and the, little, the girls died of TB and they were buried up on this hill and it was enclosed with a nice rock fence when Mrs. Benton left to go to St. Louis. She paid to have this nice rock wall built and uh, one of the houses in town has a foundation out of those rock and it's very possible it could be this one. Uh, the, Richard and Florence Pig lived here later, and then um, Henry Davis was living there when it burned in 1936. This is a great picture. Uh, <clears throat> Miss Lizzie Walker had been a slave. I want to think the guy standing next to her is Mr. Uh, Hunter, who was in the Civil War as a servant to Dr. Germ, uh, Dr. Uh, George Hunter. And then this is his son and daughter-in-law. And then on the other side, you'll see is Miss Emily uh, Sparkman Prowl. And she's dressed there in her widow's weeds. And she's, still, she's mourning her husband's death. He had died in 1903. And then there's Clint and his wife and Clint Shaw taught school for a little while, and then when they started the rural route system, he got the mail route that was Leaper's Fork and on up Bending Chestnut and Old Natchez Trace and all. And then he came to town and uh, worked in town in the, in, the, in the post office. Yes, this is a post-mortem photograph and it's Herman Martin, and he was a young boy. He, he, Mr. B uh, Will Martin was his father, and he's buried up in the cemetery at Lieber's Fort. Uh, <clears throat> somebody was talking to me about kind of gross to find pictures of dead folks, and I remember in East Tennessee, uh, some of my relatives had corpse pictures all over the wall. When they'd have a funeral, they'd take a picture of the mother or the grandmother in the, in the casket. So I guess they carried on this tradition here in Middle Tennessee too. But uh, this is uh, Bob Martin's uh, uncle. No, maybe great uncle. These guys, I think, had just joined the army and they had gotten their hair Burke haircut, and then they've there. It's kind of a funny thing where they're sticking their head through this piece of cloth, it looks like. And I'm sure uh, this is John Dorton down at the bottom, he's the one I think that was kind of adopted by the Parkers. These other guys I don't recognize, but it's heads up to them. But this is our end. Any questions? Anybody got any questions? Yes, sir. My. Did the druggist Frank Gray then come to me? He, he did. And he, he started, he started uh, Gray Drug. Yeah. Yeah, sure did. He, he actually, uh, he, bought, he, was, he, he was in partnership with Mr. Moran, John Moran. And then John Moran had made enough money, he, he, he retired and sold the business to Frank Gray. Yes. I, I suspect it was slow motion, yeah, and it was probably he had, I think it's probably a tripod. I mean, that was that period where you had a uh, 
a cloth over your head and where you could focus. I think it was. Anybody else? The pictures where there's like a backdrop or like kind of a formal. Yes. Was that in his house or? I think he... it was at his house because he didn't have a studio. You know, everybody had curtains and they. Mm -hmm. or some of, a lot of the, these traveling uh, photographers used uh, quilts and coverlets in the background or. I think my grandmother, I've got a picture of her family, and they had cedar trees. They'd cut little cedars and made that the backdrop. Yes? Rick, would it be appropriate on J.L. Sweeney to address his role in the formation of the, quote, subdivision in... Yes. Group? I should have said that because uh, uh, Silas is, is right about that. Uh, he had some land that went all the way back to the school and uh, Mr. Pinkerton, who was the banker, you know, bankers always like people to buy, borrow money to build a house. And so he talked Mr. Sweeney into subdividing his little farm into lots. And it was good for Mr. Sweeney because he gave his children all a lot in the subdivision and he named the street beside his house Joseph Street. And then there's Sycamore Street and Elm Street. And then if you turn to the right, you, you'll come right out at the at the old school. And the kids called that lane back there Dog Leg Alley because it did, it went out and then it made a dog leg and turned. And that was kind of a saying. But uh, he also brought, he, he had a brick, I must, I'd love to talk to him. One day he realized there wasn't any water in the village. Everybody had a cistern or tried to dig a well. And he looked across the hill over there at the, then, well, it was Mr. Henry Davis's place then. Later, B.F. Inman owned it. And he noticed there was a spring up there, and he said, you know, if we tap that spring and dug a line over here, people in my subdivision can have water. And that's exactly, he got the boys to go over there and start digging so much, he'd pay them so much to dig so many feet, and they piped water in, and so, Hillsborough had running water before a lot of people did. Later, what happened, uh, that became obsolete because it, uh, the S Franklin got their water for many years from Kingfield, Pinewood Road, Garrison. And so that water ran right through the village. And so the people in, Frank in Hillsborough were able to tap on. Uh, and so all those people got, they, they called it the O line, and they didn't pay water. That was the Mayberry? And Mr. Mayberry, start, Henry Mayberry here in Franklin had a spring up there between Hillsboro and Kingfield. Right. And it was a big spring. And he's, he's the one that said, you know, we can get water. It's higher. The elevation is higher. Gravity flow will bring it to Franklin. And then they pumped it into the water tower behind the courthouse. And that gave water pressure to the town of Franklin. Yeah. Thank, thank you for bringing that. I, I didn't include that in my talk. Anybody else? Well, guys, I appreciate you coming out today, and I mean tonight, I guess it is, and uh, listening to me ramble. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> and don't tarry. Get, get on home. <laughs>